Okay, I'm going to attempt to talk about something that's actually very, very difficult uh, to talk about, and and it's a sensitive t subject. So, a lot of people find it difficult to talk about, but I think it's so important, and as it relates to solution focused brief therapy, it's incredibly important. And I don't feel like I'd be doing my job uh, as an educator in solution focused brief therapy if I don't, if I'm not willing to go into this sensitive space. And uh, uh, I'm talking about diversity and, and issues related around diversity. And let me tell you, uh, there's a couple of reasons why it's on my mind right now. Uh, number one, uh, we just started our uh, online intensive solution focused brief therapy uh, training program that I do as a member of uh, Brief International. And uh, this cohort of people, they're so amazing. We actually have people from every continent in the world a part of this course. So many different countries, every continent represented, so many different cultures. And it brings about a richness of learning that is so important um, that you can only accomplish with a diverse group and respect for other people's perspectives. The other thing that is on my mind is I actually teach this course with three people that I admire greatly Adam Frower, Evan George, and Chris Iveson. And all four of us have uh, kind of different styles of doing solution-focused brief therapy. And if I'm going to be really, really honest, uh, the solution-focused community uh, has not historically been, been great at, at talking about other approaches uh, to solution-focused brief therapy in a respectful way that allows uh, other professionals to feel valued. And um, and I would like to change that. I would, I would like to do something about that. You know, solution-focused brief therapy is such a remarkable approach and there's so many different flavors of the way people do it. And I'm such a fan of, of all of them. I mean, it's so beautiful to watch Linda Metcalf do uh, what she does in the way that she combines uh, solution-focused brief therapy and narrative therapy. And it's, it's so wonderful to watch the people who study in, in Belgium who came from Luke Eisenberg's approach. And of course, the, the, the kind of historical um, uh, Milwaukee style that still adhered to those original principles like Peter DeYoung and, and those types of people. And then of course, uh, Chris uh, Iveson, Harvey Ratner, and Evan George, who, who do what's become known as the brief approach. And that's kind of the, the slant that I have. And even amongst Chris, Harvey, and Evan, they don't do it the same. And I think, I think so often people look for the right way of doing solution-focused brief therapy. And I've come to realize over the course of, of my years of training and, and teaching this approach, there is no right way to do solution-focused brief therapy. Like there is no one way to do it properly. However, I would say there is a wrong way to do it. I, I think uh, there are certain principles and guidelines and values that all of these different approaches uh, uh, have in common, even if the way they actually do the session has different variations to it. And I think that's important. I think a lot of times people will come to this approach and they will try to, they will study it with one particular person and they will try to do it like that one particular person, but then they miss something that I think is very valuable. And um, I'll use my own story to illustrate what this is. Like when I was introduced to solution focused brief therapy by Linda Metcalf, uh, I'll be very honest with you, in my first, what I was reading and, and what I was studying made so much sense to me, but the first person I actually saw do it was Linda. So I would try to emulate Linda and um, I struggled with it and I felt like I was doing it wrong. And then I, I luckily had the opportunity to meet Chris Iveson and I watched him do it. And um, there was something about the way he was doing it that made sense to me. And uh, then when I tried to replicate it and tried to put it into action, I could actually do it. And uh, that mattered to me. But here's the important part. It's very important that I try not to be Chris Iveson. It's very important that I try to be Elliot Connie as I um, learn this approach and I develop the Elliot Connie, my confidence in myself and my confidence in my style and my confidence in my approach as I adhere to the solution focused principles. And I have to do so in a way that, that values other people may do it a different way. 
And I think that's important. So as you guys out there start studying solution-focused brief therapy, and I'm now aware that people try to do it the way that Elliot Connie does it. And I, you know, I think that's a good place to start. Like, I'm not sure I would have done well if it wasn't for those early days when I was emulating Linda Metcalf and Chris Iveson. But I also want you to develop your own confidence in the way that you do it. Like maybe you don't want to ask questions or maybe it's not natural to you to ask questions in the way that Elliot Connie does or Chris Iveson does or Evan George does or Adam Furrow does or Alicia Courtney does or Yvonne Dolan does or whomever. You've got to do it in a way that you feel like you can confidently conduct the session. And I think that's where the magic is. And I think diversity matters professionally. Like we have to be able to talk about the different approaches so that learners can um, be, feel confident in the learning and not get confused and not fall into the trap of trying to do it one way or another. There are many ways to do solution focused brief therapy correctly. The other reason why I think diversity matters is also culturally. Now look, um, this is on my mind as well because recently there have been some conversations within uh, the solution focused community that I have found um, quite disheartening. As a minority male, I can tell you diversity matters at, uh, on a, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have to allow people to use their voice in the field and share their ideas from their cultural perspective because it may be different from yours. And number two, even professionally, culture matters. Because if you're not aware of the impact of culture, then when you're conducting a session, you're likely to miss very, very important things. For example, I have a friend who is uh, Italian and his mother is a tremendous cook. And this is kind of a traditional Northeast Massachusetts family where every Sunday the family gets together and has a meal. And if I call my friend, and uh, a few years ago, there was a, like a rift in his family. And I called my friend and I said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing good. I just left my family's house from dinner. That's a big deal in his family. That's a big deal in his culture. And in Solution Focused Brief Therapy, when clients come to a session, it's not uncommon that we start that session off with saying, what's been better? And if the, if the client says, oh, I, I had dinner with my family this past weekend, we have to know that may matter. And we have to ask questions like, what difference did it make to you to have dinner with your family? And then they're gonna be able to explain to you like from that particular culture, it wasn't just a dinner, it, it, was, like a, it, it was a meaningful thing. And I think whenever we end up in an environment where there is no cultural diversity, there is no ethnic, national, or even gender diversity, uh, it's a scary thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a scary thing. And I think that um, in some corners of our profession, we've accidentally ended up like that. And I think it's important that we have the conversation. I think it's important that we are able to talk about these sensitive things because it makes us better clinicians, because it makes us more sensitive to the experiences of other people. And that is a crucial skill in being a psychotherapist, and it's one that cannot be overlooked. I think, you know, when we talk about and teach solution focused brief therapy, everybody wants to know, you know, how do I ask the question, uh, the miracle question, the best hopes questions, and scaling questions, and all of these things. And while I think all of that matters, I think the underlying idea is we have to be able to ask those questions from the perspective of respect and honor and genuine curiosity about other people's experiences. And that puts the question in a position to be much more impactful. And um, I don't know that we have that conversation often enough uh, because there are certain oppressed populations that the psychotherapy session is their opportunity to be heard. It's their opportunity to be valued and I think the solution focused approach is positioned quite nicely to be able to provide that, that thing uh, to our clients. But if we don't talk about it, it becomes difficult for us to do. And it's also important in our profession that we make other professionals feel safe and comfortable to share their ideas. And I can tell you as a, a minority male who um, is, is, a, is a voice in this field, um, I have sometimes felt something other than welcome by people that surprised me. And I think those days need to come to an end. I think we need to be able to talk about our differences as strengths instead of weaknesses. I think we need to re recognize 
that the way we conduct ourselves in the profession has a direct impact in the way that we conduct ourselves in the session. We have to hold ourselves to a standard all the time. We're not going to do great if we're picking on people's differences and if we're not respecting people's differences uh, outside of the session, it's going to be di very difficult to transfer that into uh, the session. And I think we need, to, we need to think about that. So as you think about applying solution-focused brief therapy in your work, I hope that you're able to identify and, and hope you're able to um, experience um, that diversity matters. And uh, it matters on almost all levels and almost all corners of the world and, and all walks of life. And it impacts us professionally in ways that I don't think we've yet learned to comfortably talk about. So I hope this video um, contributes to a positive, cohesive dialogue that quite frankly, I think we need to be having. And it makes us more sensitive clinicians which inherently makes us better clinicians. So thank you for watching the video. It's a little bit longer than the, than the videos I normally make, but um, it's been on my mind for a bit. So I wanted to, to share this and uh, I can't, I, you know, I, I thank you so much for, for watching. I hope you appreciated it. Uh, please help me spread this message by liking this video, sharing this video, uh, leaving a comment for this video. Uh, I'm very interested in this dialogue continuing. I'm very interested in, um, in, contributing to a positive change in this field because our clients deserve the very best we got. So please like, comment, and share this video, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.